Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the October 2020 Advocacy Sector Conversation Series. My name is Melissa Hayu, and I'm the coordinator of the Disability Advocacy Resource Unit. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Once again, we are delivering these forums online in this new format due to the new normals we find ourselves in due to COVID-19. We are pleased to be able to still bring the advocacy sector conversation to you safely and online. Like many of you, we are seeing some unexpected benefits in this type of program delivery. And we will be coming back to you sometime soon to get your feedback on what you like and dislike about this format so that we can see to continually improve and provide the best experience we can for you. So please let us know what you think. You will note that we have Auslan interpreter today and we also have captioning that you can access. So if you go to the chat box, you will see a link that you can click to access the closed captioning in a separate browser. We encourage your active participation today, so please type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box. And at the end of the session, I will be facilitating a Q&A session with our presenter. So I hope you've all settled in comfortably and ready for a great session ahead. So, the Disability Support Pension. We all know what a headache that can be to apply for. Applications for the DSP are too often rejected due to the lack of sufficient medical evidence. DSP Help is a fantastic tool that helps you get the best supportive documentation from your medical specialist, which gives you the best chance of having your application approved. Dermot Williams is a community lawyer at Social Security Rights Victoria, who has been involved with the development of DSP Help, and he introduces you to this new, exciting new online resource. Please welcome Dermot Williams. Thanks, Melissa, and thank you everyone for coming today. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the disability support pension. Um, and as Melissa says, the DSP help resource that we've developed. Um, just quickly, I would like to say thank you to Melissa and the team at uh, Daru for making today possible. I would also just like to acknowledge the, uh, the knowledge and experience of disability advocates uh, with us today. Uh, SSRV knows how knowledgeable and experienced you all are. And um, as part of DSP Help, we've consulted with disability advocates and it's been incredibly valuable for us to be able to draw on that knowledge and use it to put together the resource that we have. Uh, just briefly, a little bit about Social Security Rights Victoria. We are an independent statewide community legal centre. We specialise in social security law, policy and procedure. We aim to help vulnerable and disadvantaged Victorians appeal wrongful Centrelink decisions. That's the core of the work we do. Uh, we also engage in systemic advocacy to try and get things, particularly social security law, made more fair. And we provide training and support to workers such as yourself. And just a, a quick note on how we view social security. We view it as a fundamental human right, as noted in the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights and the International Con Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So to today's session, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about DSP eligibility. Um, I'll give a high level overview of what that is, but I'll also be talking about some of the challenges that we see people uh, face when they're trying to access the DSP. I'll then move on to talking about DSP Help, the resource itself. Uh, so that's the website, but also the legal service that wraps around the website. Uh, finally, I will just briefly mention how you can access SSRV if you want to uh, get further assistance or you have a referral that you'd like to make. And then as Melissa mentioned, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay, so the Disability Support Pension or the DSP 
is an income support payment for people who cannot work due to illness, injury, or disability. To get the DSP, you need to have a physical, intellectual, or psychiatric condition that is permanent. You need to be rated as having 20 points under the impairment tables, and you need to have a continuing inability to work. There's a bit of nuance to each of those points though. So if we start by looking at permanent conditions, a permanent condition isn't a permanent condition as we would normally think of it. A permanent condition is a condition that has been fully diagnosed, fully treated, and fully stabilized. So what does each of those mean? A fully diagnosed condition is a condition that the doctors who have been treating it know what's going on and have given a diagnosis. They've formally said, this is what the condition is. That's not normally too controversial. That's one of the, the simpler aspects to, to show in a DSP application. Fully treated means that the condition, everything that is reasonable to treat the condition has been done. There's nothing left to, to do to treat the condition. Um, one common thing that comes up is people on waiting lists for surgery, for example, may not be considered fully treated until they've had that surgery. One interesting uh, matter that we worked on recently was um, a, a young person who had uh, autism spectrum disorder, he, an autism spectrum disorder. Um, he had managed to get NDIS funding with the support of his family. And as part of that, he had a, a long report explaining a bunch of different things that um, and supports that would help him and improve his life. When he applied for the DSP, Centrelink jumped on that and said, this is not fully treated. You've got all these things here that you need to do before we can consider you fully treated. As you will know, NDIS support is not given for to treat conditions. It's given for people who have already been assessed as having a permanent condition, albeit through a different mechanism uh, that the NDIS uses. We took that argument to the tribunal and said, look, this is this is not treatment. This is um, you know supports that are going to help this person with their quality of life, but they're not going to improve the condition. And we won that one. So. I guess what I'm trying to highlight here is that it is whether something is fully treated or not is a complex question and Centrelink doesn't always get it right. And it, you need to dive into it to actually work out, hang on, is the treatment reasonable? Is it something that they should access? Is it something that prevents the person from being fully treated? Fully stabilized, a condition is fully stabilized if it will show no significant functional improvement even with reasonable treatment or if all the reasonable treatment has been had over the next two years. Um, another interesting matter that we, we've seen is a person who had MS, multiple scler sclerosis. Of course, that is a degenerative condition and as a general rule is only going to get worse and will always get worse. And Centrelink again took a very simplistic view and said, this is not fully stabilized. It is not going to stay the same and to get worse and rejected the DSP on that basis. Of course, we argued that that's not how it should be viewed. It is degenerative. It's not going to stay the same, but it's not going to get better either. And we were again successful there. Um, one important thing to note here is that Permanent, again, does not mean permanent. It means permanent over the next two years, and that's it. If you manage to get past that point in the DSP eligibility, uh, you then need to have 20 points under the impairment tables. And I've just got the list of impairment tables there, and you can see that they cover a, a, wide, a wide range of impairments. Um, starting with things that affect particular parts of the body, like the upper limbs, lower limbs, spine, uh, moving to things like mental health, to brain function, um, to hearing and visual function, and even down to things like consciousness for conditions such as epilepsy, where you have seizures. One thing to note here, and one challenge that we see is there is no table for pain. Someone who is experiencing chronic pain uh, which can be quite debilitating and can prevent them from working, 
will need to have their condition um, or the pain assessed, the impact of the pain assessed under one of the other tables, whether it's upper limb because the pain is affecting their arms and hands or whether it's just generally affecting them and needs to be assessed on table one. It's preventing them from um, being able to perform actions consistently. In terms of what the tables look like, and we've got an example here of table three for lower limb function for the 20 points rating. Uh, to get 20 points under this table, a person must be unable to do any of the following. Walk around a shopping center or supermarket without assistance. Walk from a car park into a shopping center or supermarket without assistance. Stand up from a sitting position without assistance and they must require assistance to use public transport. This table provides some clarification about who it applies to and notes that people who can move around, um, sorry, people who require assistance to move around in a wheelchair or transfer to or from a wheelchair um, may fit under this category. People who uh, require assistance to move around even while using walking aids, such as a stick or crutches, um, could also fit into this category. Now, one word that I've mentioned there is assistance. I've mentioned that several times for each of the criteria there. And I think this highlights another challenge people face with the disability support pension. To the average person or to the average disability support pension applicant, assistance may include things like using a wheelchair or using a walking stick or using crutches. But in, in these impairment tables, assistance generally has a very specific meaning and it means assistance from another person. If you need a walking stick, for example, that is relevant to the impairment tables, but it does not count as assistance for the purposes of the, of the impairment tables. It has to be from another person. Um, and for me, I think this highlights the challenge of just people understanding what they're being assessed on because it's not clear from what we're reading on the screen right now that that's what assistance means. It's in the preamble to the tables where this is contained, where it says that, and it says it in quite a roundabout way as well. So for me, as a lawyer who deals with legislation all the time, this may be relatively easy to, to pass and um, to understand and to comprehend. And it may be relatively easy for you as a disability advocate to do the same, having had experience with this, having looked at these tables um, over and over and regularly. But for a person who is not trained, who does not have the experience, who may have come across the, uh, the disability sorry, who may have needed the disability support pension suddenly because they've had an accident, that's what's caused their disability. They've never had to engage with the system before that. It's really difficult to then go in here and understand it for yourself, what you're being assessed on. Um, finally, if you assessed as having a fully diagnosed, treated and stabilized condition, and it is rated as 20 points under the impairment tables, you will need to show that you have a continuing inability to work. Again, this means over the next two years, and it means that you are unable to do work of at least 15 hours per week. Um, it's important to note, I haven't put it on the slides there, but when we're talking about work, we're talking about work at or above the minimum wage. So um, if there is work that someone can do, but it is not at or above the minimum wage, it's not going to count for this test. Um, if you, sorry, the fourth and final uh, criteria for the disability support pension, which I haven't mentioned earlier because it is a conditional, um, conditional thing, is the program of support. Some people will need to participate in a program of support and they'll normally need to do 18 months uh, in the three years before applying for the disability support pension. A program of support is a program which is completed through an employment service provider normally. So that could be a job active provider for people who are on new start or job seeker payment, or it could be a disability employment service, again, for people on new start or um, job seeker payment, but for people who have been assessed as needing that extra support. 
what it looks like is it, it may include applying for jobs, doing training, um, having other support activities to improve a person's work capacity. And what's really important to note is that if someone has a medical exemption from those activities associated with Job Seeker or New Start, while they're on that medical exemption, that time will not be counting towards the 18 months. So to give an example, uh, Sam has a back injury and depression and had to stop working. He's been on New Start and enrolled in a program of support for 18 months. Sam got a medical exemption for about six months because he didn't feel up to going to his employment service provider for the training. Sam will need to do a further six months of a program of support before he can claim the DSP. When does a program of support not have to be completed? Uh, when a person has a severe impairment. So what that means is if you get 20 points under a single table, you don't have to do a program of support. If you have 20 points, but they're spread across several tables, uh, you will have to do the program of support. And this, again, highlights another challenge uh, people have when they access the disability support pension that I've seen in my own work. The, the challenge is that it, it seems to be that the expectation is that a person who has several minor impairments is going to be better able to improve their ability to find and keep work than a person who has one big impairment. But that may not be the case. A person who ha has several impairments, several conditions that are affecting their life may in fact be less able to, um, to engage with the program of support and improve their work capacity because they're affected in a number of different ways versus the person who is affected in one way. Of course, everyone's individual circumstances is different and there's no real general rule, but I think that the general rule that appears to be applied is not taking that into account. Um, it also creates some weird situations where you have someone who may have 30 or 40 points overall. So they have significant impairments in their life, but because they have them spread out across four tables, for example, with 10 points each, they too have to participate in the program of support. When a person is enrolled, but unable to improve their ability to find work through the program because of their impairment, they may not have to complete the 18 months. Um, when the employment service provider makes that assessment and says, we can't assist this person because of their impairment, we're not going to be able to do anything to make their chance of finding work better, they again may not have to complete the 18 months. Um, if a person is applying for the disability support pension, it is important to enroll to show active participation. And then it's important if they don't finish the 18 months to get information about why that is and link it to their impairment. Okay. so. I've spoken a bit about uh, some of the challenges and some of the high level eligibility um, criteria for the DSB. What I'd like to speak about now is medical evidence. Medical evidence is vital to the likely success of applications and appeals. It is essentially what is being assessed when Centrelink are making a decision about the DSB. And it is also the thing that is most in the control, though not completely in the control, of DSP applicants. It's something that they can approach their doctors and specialists and try and get to improve their chances of success. It's important to note that when gathering medical evidence, the date of the application and the 13 weeks following is the qualification period. So when Centrelink are making a decision about whether a person is eligible, they're looking at that 13 week period and determining whether they're eligible then. For a new application, this is not too controversial. They're putting in the information and making an assessment at the time. For an appeal, this can become quite relevant. Often appeals can happen months or even years after the initial application and the person running the appeal and making the decision will have to look back and determine whether the person was eligible when they applied. 
this is also challenging for applicants who may not have understood fully what they were applying for or what they needed to do to be successful. And so they've put in an application, they've been rejected, they've gone through the appeals process and it's several months later, and they may come to us, for example, and say, look, I don't know what's going on here. I think I should be on the DSP. They haven't given it to me though. What do I do? We may look at their documents and say, look, your medical evidence is not actually showing that you're eligible. The best thing you can do is go and get new medical evidence, but you're going to have to ask your doctors to tell you what your conditions were like several months ago. Otherwise it may not be considered. Um, that said, medical evidence doesn't have to come into existence during the application period or the qualification period. It just needs to be referable to it. So if a person can get their doctors to say, I've been treating this person for years at the time they applied, their conditions were like this, that can be helpful. Um, one final note before I move on to talking a little bit about DSP help itself. Uh, is just multiple conditions and impairments. I've spoken a little bit about this uh, for programs of support. It's important to note that conditions are separate from impairments when it comes to disability support pension eligibility. A condition is a condition, an impairment is the impact of that condition on the person and what they can do. Uh, where one condition causes multiple impairments, each impairment should be considered separately and have its own rating. Good example of this is um, diabetes, which could have um, an impact on general stamina. It could also have an impact on the digestive system. It could also have an impact on the limbs, lower limbs and upper limbs um, and that kind of thing. On the other side of things, where you have multiple conditions causing a combined impairment, they should be given a single impairment rating. So for example, a person might have osteoarthritis in their hands. They may also have um, a condition with their upper arms that um, impacts what they can do, where they can move their arms around. Both of those conditions would contribute to the upper limb table. So as I've noted there, in other words, impairment ratings are given for impairments, not conditions. Okay, so um, DSP help. This is the resource that we've put together to try and help people that are facing some of these issues. And in particular, people that are having trouble getting medical evidence to support their application. Um, I won't be doing a demonstration of DSP help today. I won't actually be bringing up the website on screen to show you, um, though I do have some screenshots in my slides here. I do have, I have put the link to DSP help on the slides there, and I would encourage everyone to have a look at it um, and, you know, see for yourself what we've got there and how we've laid out the information. And one thing I will note is that we have, sorry, I should give some background here. The process that we've gone through for DSP help is one that's been using uh, human centered design and technology. Those were the two key parts of our design process here. So we've engaged with DSP applicants. We've also engaged with uh, people who are supporting applicants uh, to access the DSP, including disability advocates. Um, we've used the information from those consultations to try and make this as fit for purpose as we can, but it is a first iteration. So it doesn't, it's not, um, as our designer said, it's not the Rolls Royce, it's the the Mazda, the serviceable car that does what we needed to do, but can be improved on and made better in the future. So that was a very long winded way of saying, if you look at this and you see something that could be improved something that could be done better, or you just want to see something changed for some reason, let us know. Feedback is super important to us for this, and it's going to be super important for our ongoing design process. Okay, that said, I'm going to go through a few things about DSP help and explain how it's supposed to work. Um, so the idea is that we can guide people through the disability, uh, the DSP process when they come to the website. So when they land on the homepage, they are given these options here. They can either choose to go specifically to uh, their 
the option that they're after. So it may be they know that they have issues with getting the right medical evidence. They can go straight to that page or they can start at understanding the disability support pension and work through it in order to understand the, the process completely. We've tried to cover everything that a person would need to know um, about the DSP when they're applying. So we've included information about eligibility, about gathering the right medical evidence, about applying, actually getting the uh, application form and putting it in, and what to do if there is a rejection, what options there are. As I noted, uh, the information is presented in an order, though users can access information they need directly or work um, or go straight to the information that they want. At the end of each page, there is a suggested next page for people to move on to. So it's very, we're trying to be very clear about how people can move through this information. At the core of DSP Help is the medical evidence chatbot, and this is really the heart of the resource. Uh, we've used the Joseph platform to create an automated chatbot, which users can engage with to help understand their conditions and their impairments, help collect that information or put that information down in a central place and produce a customized medical evidence kit that they can use when gathering medical evidence. So the idea here is that people uh, land on this page, uh, the bot starts asking questions. It starts with, what's your name and what would, uh, what would you like us to call you? And then it asks them some questions about their impairments. Um, particularly, what kind of impairments do they have? So it might ask, do you have impairments of your arms and upper limbs? Do you have impairments of your legs and lower limbs? Um, do you have mental health conditions? Do you have digestive conditions? Those sorts of questions. It then gives a users an opportunity to talk about how their conditions affect them day to day, what they can and can't do, what they're living with. It will then take that information and put it into the medical evidence kit, which is essentially a letter um, and instructions for doctors to give medical evidence. Um, it also includes some information for the user themselves so that they've got something that they can take away from the website as a reminder about what they need to do and how they can help support their own application. Um, as you can see here, it, it, the first page, uh, which I've just included an excerpt from, uh, gives some information for the doctors about why the DSP is important and why it is that this person is coming to them and asking for this information and why they're essentially the gatekeepers to the dis disability support pension in many ways. We include information for the doctors uh, so that they can get help directly. Um, if they want, they can jump on DSP help themselves and see the information themselves, or they could even contact SSRV and have a chat to one of our lawyers about what they need to do. In personalization, um, the two main things that the, the kit does is first, it helps a person identify and then list the tables that could affect them. The tables, as I've mentioned early, earlier, are an opaque and difficult instrument to engage with. We're hoping that if a person can narrow down which tables are relevant to them, they may have an easier time of diving in and, and really grappling with what they need to show. We're hoping that applies to the doctors as well. The second main way that this is personalized is it gives, it, it records and compiles the information that the user has entered in. So um, in the second excerpt on screen there, um, I've got, John has done a self-assessment. This is a mock-up, by the way, this is not a real person. Um, John has done a self-assessment and we have included this below. Uh, in relation to table one, functions requiring physical exertion, I can't walk very far. I need help to get around the shops. I can only get around with a walking frame, but even that's a, a difficult to use most of the time. In relation to table two, upper limbs, I struggle to do up buttons. I can't lift things or do much above my head. My partner has to get things from the top shelves for me. 
The idea here is that having this information all in one place and being able to hand it to someone, such as the doctors, rather than explain it verbally, may make it easier for people to communicate to their doctors about what they need from them to support their application. As I mentioned earlier, DSP Help is not just a website, it is also a wraparound legal service. At the top of every page on DSP Help, we have a, an option uh, for people to get help. DSP Help is aimed at people who have some capacity to self-advocate, people that are able to help themselves, but may not be equipped with the right information and tools to do that effectively. There are going to be people that this website that need more support than a website can offer. And for those people, they can contact us directly and we can give them information, advice and further assistance services. Uh, we also acknowledge that some people aren't going to want to come to a legal service or talk to a lawyer about this. They may be intimidated by that, though I hope they're not intimidated by me personally. Um, for those people, we've also included links to other services, including a link to Daru's Advocate Finder so that they can get in touch with a disability advocate. Support workers are most welcome to use DSP help as well. Um, not only for the information, though that is obviously useful, uh, but we found and heard from some support workers that using the medical evidence chatbot can be helpful uh, with clients. So, uh, and this is something that I've done myself as well in my own casework. It can be helpful to sit down with the client and ask them the questions that the bot is asking and enter the answers for them. And then use that to produce the medical evidence kit and then of course, send it to them so that they've got it there. So in that way, people who may not be comfortable logging onto the website and doing this themselves, but could still benefit from having a customized medical evidence kit can still access um, the service in that way. I'm just gonna go back two steps. So yeah, look, I've, I've actually run through uh, most of the content that I had planned much quicker than I thought I would. Um, so I'm just going to jump past the questions slide and just quickly mention um, how you can get in touch with um, us. As disability advocates, uh, you can access our worker helpline. Um, basically, you can give us a call and you can have us a chat about any Centrelink legal problems, but specifically, you can talk to us about the disability support pension. Um, if you would like to make a referral, if you'd like us to take a matter over, this is the best way to, uh, to access that. Give us a call, tell us about the issues, and let us know that you'd like to make the referral. If you would like to make a, a cold referral, you can also give your clients um, our general advice line. Um, and sorry, I know I haven't left these up on the screen, but they are available on our website and we can send out some information later if you would like. Um, but yeah, you can give them the general advice line and they can come through and call us directly. Um, so look, we do have some an opportunity for questions, but I'm mindful that we've got um, a bit of extra time there. Um, Melissa, would you like to do questions? Have we got many? Or I can possibly um, talk about some case studies if you prefer me to um, do some more content. Well, thank you very much, Dermot. That was really useful. And no doubt advocates will be bookmarking this site as we speak. Um, I think before we go to questions, the first thing I would like to let people know is that the whole recording of this session, like the slides associated, the slides associated with it, will be available on the Daru website at a later date for you to look at, as well as all the contact details and options to call for help as well. So um, we've got a couple of questions. I'm just um, clicking them live now. So um, if you have a question you would like to ask, remember to type them in the Q&A box on your screen and I'll pop them up. So this one's a long one. So when Centrelink reject a DSP claim and people ask Centrelink for a review, is it right when Centrelink say you can only get a review when you provide more evidence? And if you do not have more evidence, they do not review their decision. That is completely incorrect. Uh, everyone has a 
a right to have uh, Centrelink review decisions that they make, and that applies to any decision that they make. And the, the best way to access that in the first instance is to ask for an authorised review officer to review it. The, you don't need to provide any information or documents or evidence or anything to access that review process. It is enough to call them up and say, I disagree with this decision, I want it reviewed. That said, in some cases, it is going to be very helpful if you can get documentation and evidence to, um, to show why it's wrong, but that's going to depend on the individual circumstances of the case. Yeah. Next question. The eligibility seemed almost discriminatory. Is there any way of changing the act to make the tables fairer? I think there are many ways to uh, change the act to make the tables fairer. Uh, one thing that I should note, which I haven't touched on yet, is there is potentially um, an impairment table review in the works. Um, I'm not personally going to get political about that today, but I will note that whether that is going to make it fairer or unfairer is going to depend on you know how it's drafted and what they what changes they actually make. Um, for my personal view, I think that one of the unfairest or most challenging parts of disability support pension eligibility is the program of support requirement, that extra requirement that you have if you don't get 20 points under one table. And as a bit of a thought exercise, I considered what the tables would look like if you don't have that requirement. And I do think that they look a lot fairer or a lot less challenging to engage with if you don't have that. If you can get, you need, still need to get 20 points, but it can be spread out over multiple tables. Um, that seems a lot easier. And it will be a lot easier to understand because often program of support is one of the most tricky bits to explain to a, a client who's having trouble um, with the DSP. Thank you. The next one. Oh, this is an interesting one. Will a HUDAS 2 assessment assist in evidence for Centrelink DSP? I wonder what that acronym stands for. Do you know, Dermot? I'm not sure myself. I'm glad that that's not just me. <laughs> W-H-O-D-A-S, I'm not sure what that acronym is. While we wait for hopefully some clarification from the person asking a question, perfect, next one. Could you use the medical help bot to assist with NDIS medical evidence? Um, I have to admit that I'm not sure about the NDIS um, medical requirements. Um, because we don't deal with NDIS ourselves at SSRV. So I'm, I'm tempted to say probably not because the, the medical help bot is, um, it's very much focused on the DSP criteria and specifically on the impairment tables for the DSP. Um, that said, I mean, I, I doubt it's something that we're ever going to do. Like I said, NDIS is a little bit out of the scope of what we do. Um, but maybe that's something that someone could explore to have a, a similar sort of setup um, to help people with the NDIS. I've just got clarification. I believe the who that thing refers to NDIS assessment. So I believe that will be the same kind of answer. And I think sure. that is all the questions that we have today. Oh. It says the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule. Well, there you go. I've learned something new myself. So that so is all I. the questions that we've had today. So I would like to thank you, Joe, for giving us your time today. And I've got no doubt that this tool will be very much used in the sector and will make a life a lot easier for so many people. So thank you for the work and effort you and your team have put into it. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So everybody, we've come to a close today. I would like to thank the Social Security Rat Victoria and Dermot William for his time to bring this presentation to you today and for the great work that's happening in this space. Thank you to the Outline interpreters and captioners for their hard work today. Thank you to Show Division for bringing this production to you today. Please stay safe, wear your masks, wash those hands and stay home. See you next time.